Hey, good morning, Mark. It's good to see you. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to New Hope Church. My name is Pastor Chris, and on behalf of Pastor Sarah and all the staff here, we welcome you to worship. Uh, this morning, we are kicking off a series on faith and. Uh, Pastor Sarah is going to kick, the, kick us off this morning by talking about faith and anxiety, but we're talking about what it is to be in unity together with other Christians. So we're really excited to, to kick this off uh, looking at uh, one of the letters of the Apostle Paul. But before we get into all of that, just a few uh, announcements to get our morning started. Right after the service today, head out and grab a cup of coffee and then come back into the sanctuary. We'll have our town hall meeting. Uh, we're going to elect some new elders and deacons. Uh, we've got some other exciting announcements and updates to give to you, so we hope that you'll plan to stick around this morning for a few minutes. Um, we have an opportunity coming up this summer with our Vacation Bible School for some of you to help volunteer. We have hundreds of kids here for Vacation Bible School, and it really does require a lot of volunteer support. And so there are a sign up there uh, back in the narthex that you can check out, uh, read in your bulletin for more information, but we're in need of just about everything still at this point. So we would love to have you come and join us for Vacation Bible School as a volunteer. Next Sunday, mean to become a mean to become a member of New Hope to come and join Pastor Sarah and some of our church elders uh, around tables for some food and conversation about what it is to be a member of New Hope, and we certainly hope that you will join us for that. There's a sign-up sheet uh, that is back in the narthex. If you could let us know that you're planning to attend, that way we know the right amount of food to order for that day. But we're really looking forward to that. Uh, it's going to be a great time. There's lots of other things happening in the life of our church, so be sure to check out the bulletin and uh, our Friday newsletter as well for all of the information and updates about all of our programs and ministries here at New Hope. God calls us to worship this morning in the words of Psalm 96. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name, tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. Let's stand and sing to our great God together. Imagine 
Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, we thank you for the opportunity to gather in your presence this morning that we might worship you. We pray that you would be with Pastor Sarah as she proclaims your message of good news to us this morning, and that all of the prayers that we pray and the songs that we sing might be pleasing to you. Lord, send your Holy Spirit to dwell among us this morning and always, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So great to see all of you here worshiping with us this morning. I invite you to turn and greet your neighbor in the name of Jesus. Yeah. Do you have the map of... All right, at this time, I'd like to invite all of the children to come and join me down front here for a special time with all of you. Hi. Good 
Good morning, friends. Did you all have a good Easter? Yes. Did you have good food with family? And did you get baskets from the Easter bunny? And my Easter got me pink squishy. Ooh, fun. So, so you got some fun toys and candy and all of those things. Exciting. Well, guess what? It's still Easter. <laughs> Be- yes, because Easter lasts for six long weeks in the church calendar. We have several weeks that we get to keep singing our hallelujahs and our excitement about being in the presence of the risen Christ. I have a question for all of you this morning. Do you all gather around a table in your home to eat food? Yeah, yeah, sometimes for dinner with your family. When you gather around the table to eat with your families, what do you talk about? What's something you talk about? Your favorite parts, yeah? Of the, your favorite parts of the day. Yeah, right, you share about your day. What else do you do? Yeah. What you did at school, yeah. Anything else you talk about? <laughs> yeah, those are kind of the main things. What else, Danny? <laughs> what you want to do tomorrow. So you kind of plan ahead for tomorrow, right? So you guys can tell me other things later. So, yeah, you share about your day because we could get into some dangerous territory here. <laughs> <laughs> you can keep your family secrets, your family secrets, right? But sometimes you share secrets too. You share about your day. You share about what you're going to do tomorrow. You share about your favorite parts. Sometimes you share about your least favorite parts, right? We have conversation around the dinner table. Do you know where the church's dinner table is? Right behind me. <laughs> right behind me. This is the church's dinner table. And it's here, we call it our communion table, that Jesus prepares the meal for us and welcomes us to partake of the bread. Which re- what does the bread represent again? Do you remember? The body. the body of Jesus, right? And the cup that we have, grape juice, what does that represent? The blood. The blood that's right. The blood of Jesus reminds us of the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. And when we come and gather around the table and eat at the table together, we're reminded that God forgives us and God loves us and God calls us to go and share about Jesus with everyone that we know. But sometimes we have difficult conversations around the dinner table. Even here at the church, sometimes we have difficult conversations. And Pastor Chris and I are going to talk about that with everybody over the next few weeks, about those tough conversations that we have as a church. But guess what? Even in those tough conversations, we still get to eat together. <laughs> and so we're going to eat together today. So you guys, yay! Exactly, Natalie. It's exciting. <laughs> you guys are going to go to Sunday school, but the elders are going to make sure to bring you communion today. And they'll talk about that in your rooms. And if you're unsure whether or not you're ready to take communion, that's okay. You can talk about it with your parents and join us next time as well. But can we all fold our hands and bow our heads and let's say a prayer together. God, we thank you that you give us dinner tables to gather around, and you give us food to savor and enjoy. And God, we pray for those who don't have food today, and we pray that you would help us to know how to provide for them. But most importantly today, God, we thank you for the table that you call us to, and we pray that we will be good stewards of your gifts of grace. In your name we pray, amen. All right, we haven't done this in a while, but we're going to make our L's and bless the congregation. The congregation is going to bless you, and then you'll head off to Sunday school. So are you ready? The Lord be with you, and congregation responds, and also with you. All right, have a wonderful time in Sunday school, everybody. Want to know what the best part of my Easter was? What? <laughs> nice. <laughs> Typically, the Sunday after Easter is known as Low Sunday in the church. I think this might be the first year where you all proved that Sunday wrong. (laughs) So thank you for being here today. Maybe because Easter was so early, we're all off kilter on when things are happening. But it is a joy to be with you all. If you could find those black registration pads, take them out there in the center aisles here. Make sure you pass them down to the pew. Write your name, a piece of information about yourself. We love to be able to extend a welcome. 
um, and ho act of hospitality to you here at New Hope. Our God our God is a generous God. We're going to talk about the grace that God continually gives us over and over and over again. And in that generosity, God calls us in turn to be generous one, with one another. And we do that in a variety of ways. We serve with our time and our strengths. And we do have sign-up sheets at the Welcome Center. If you would like to serve at the Ronald McDonald House in the next couple of months, there's information about that. We serve by giving things um, and items that are desperately needed by people in our community. So if you'd like to help support the I Support the Girls Foundation, there's information out in the Narthex about that as well. Those are our mission activities this month. But God also takes our finances, our generosity, and transforms it into signs and symbols of his love for this world. So I thank you for your generosity, and I pray a blessing on the Holy Spirit for your continued generosity. Our offering will be taken at this time. Would you please pray with me? God, your scripture and your word is living and active, sharper than a two-edged sword dividing bone from marrow. And so, Lord, as we enter into your word today, we know that it'll be a word of challenge. And yet in that challenge, I pray for your spirit of comfort to be present with us. I pray for your spirit of gentleness to fall upon us. 
so that we may hear your word to us clearly. Speak, O Lord, I pray, for we are ready to listen. In your name, amen. When I was in college, my dorm would have movie nights now and then, and one of the movie nights was an indie flick called Saved. And this film follows a group of Christian high school students and some of the misfits among them. It's a film that pokes a little fun at the Christian faith, but also puts a mirror up to our Christian faith to challenge us to take an inward look at ourselves, to do what Jesus says in his Sermon on the Mount, take the plank out of your own eye before you point at the speck on somebody else's. The film follows a main character, her name is Mary. Mary gets in some trouble, not to spoil the film in case you want to watch it. And her friend, she kind of drifts herself away from her friend group. And the pastor of the high school pulls the friends aside and says, you know, I need you to check in on Mary. There's something going on. Go find out what's going on with her. So the friends, this is the poking fun at Christianity a little bit, in the best of intentions decide to kidnap Mary and perform an exorcism on her. (laughs) Mary, totally appalled that her friends would think to do this, tries to flee from the scene. And who was once her best friend by the name of Hilary Fay is holding the Bible And they're having a conversation of anger and conflict at each other, a conversation of misunderstanding. And at one point, Hilary Fay throws the Bible at Mary, saying, I am filled with Christ's love. (laughs) There's a beat of silence, and Mary picks up the Bible and holds it out to her and says, this is not a weapon. Amen. This is not a weapon. But the sad truth that I'm starting to see over and over and over again, and the truth is it's been going on for generations within the Christian faith, is how quick we can be to turn this into a weapon against each other. Now, some of you who know your Bible well might be thinking, but wait a minute, Pastor Sarah, Paul calls the Bible the sword of truth. (laughs) It is meant to be a weapon in battle against this world, to which I would say, gold star for you, you know your Bible. However, remember context within scripture. And part of the challenge is when we pull things out of context because Paul begins that whole armor of God passage by reminding us that our battle is not with flesh and blood, but with the powers and principalities of darkness in this world. Too often we're using this against flesh and blood. And far too often we're using this to prove Our version and our values in this world is the right thing instead of using this as the tool to show people Jesus, to help people have an encounter with the living Christ who is here to call us to repentance, to forgive us, to show us a new way to live that brings about life instead of death. So I invite you, as we begin this new sermon series about having the tough conversations, as we begin this series exploring one chapter in Paul's letter to the Ephesians, I invite you to have ears ready and willing to listen. I invite you to be challenged. I invite you to lean in to the conversation, but most importantly, I invite you to keep your eyes fixed on Jesus because that has to be our starting place as a people of faith. Turn with me, if you will, to Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to read verses 1 through 6 and then jump to verse 17. Paul writes, I therefore, the prisoner in the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called. 
with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you are called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. And then jumping to verse 17. Now this I affirm and insist on in the Lord. You must no longer live as the Gentiles live in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of their ignorance and hardness of heart. They have lost all sensitivity and have abandoned themselves to licenses, licenses and greedy to every practice, every kind of impurity. That is not the way you learned Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now, Paul's time in Ephesus is recorded for us in Acts 19. Paul spent two years in this city that at the time of Paul was the center of worship for the Roman and Greek gods, the Gentiles, people who were of Greek and Roman origin, who weren't of Jewish origin, and who didn't believe in Jesus. Paul's two years there turns into people hearing about who Jesus is, and there grows a good Christian community out of it. But they're still combating with the ways of the world in which they're living in. And so Paul, while he's later in life imprisoned in Rome, writes this letter to the Christians in Ephesians to help them hold fast to the truth they know in Jesus Christ. Paul's letter is kind of divided into two parts. The first part, chapters 1 through 3, focusing on the reality of who Jesus is, of how all of history came together in that moment when the word became flesh, when the incarnate Jesus Christ was born in a stable in Bethlehem. He talks about how that Jesus grew up to teach amazing, wondrous things that puzzled and challenged people. That this Jesus came to eat with sinners and eat with the religious authorities and leaders of the day. And that this Jesus then went to the cross for you to take upon him all the troubles of this world. And that this Jesus, as we celebrated last Sunday, rose again from the dead to completely destroy the power that those dark, evil forces have over this world. And God writes a, 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 rather, Paul writes a beautiful prayer about God's amazing love to the Ephesians. And reminds them that our God is a God that can do possibly more than we could ask or imagine. All of that is in the first part. It's all about Jesus. The second part of the letter, and part of what we're going to focus in on, talks about, so if you know Jesus, if you've had that encounter with the living Christ, then it absolutely changes everything about how you live in this world. It impacts your relationships with your families, with the community. It impacts what you do, what you say, how you treat other people. Everything is wrapped up in following that example of Christ. And Paul knows that there are infighting and there are divisions within the church about how to do this. So he begins chapter 4 by begging them to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called, he says. He's begging them to do so with humility and gentleness, patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to keep that unity of the Spirit, even in conflict and in disagreements. And he points out that that old life, the old life they used to be living, the old life that the world is still living in, we're not meant to follow that path anymore because that's not the path of Christ. So what does all of this mean for you and me as Christians living in 2024 today? 
sermon title for today is called Faith and Anxiety. And anxiety I define as the thing, that feeling that you get when you're nervous, when you're unsure about what's coming next, when you feel uncomfortable, and when you're really, really worried. Everybody has anxiety. Every single human being that has been born on this planet deals with anxiety in some way, shape, or form. Now, there are people that have chronic anxiety that need extra care and help from a mental health perspective with anxiety. I'm not talking about that form of anxiety. I encourage you, sidebar, come to the mental health panel on Sunday evening at 7 p.m. to talk more about that particular form of anxiety. And I hope you're there because it is certainly a big issue in our world today. But let's keep it in the anxiety understanding of what scripture talks about when it encourages us to not be anxious about anything, but to go to God in prayer, to not fear, to not worry because God is with us. But when conflict arises, when we start to feel uncomfortable, the anxiety starts to rise. And Christians, we think we'll be different from the world's, but often we're just like the world. We are human after all. So let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. The Christian church in America, we're gonna keep ourselves focused in here, right now has the top three major things that are consuming the energy of the church. You would hope would be evangelism, mission, and Sacraments, worship, (laughs) right? Guess what they actually are? You probably know. Homosexuality, abortion, women in leadership. And I could feel all your anxiety just go, whoop, she said it. (laughs) She named the things. (laughs) What are we going to do about this? And the problem is that when we as Christians, because we're feeding into the culture, our culture that is so polarized on these topics right now, and that we're feeling within the anxiety that we have to have the right answer. And so we turn back to scripture to give us the right answer, but our anxiety is driving us in trying to find the right answer because I need to be on the right side and I've got to please people and my brain is spinning and I've got to care for people. So I'm going to go to this and I'm going to pull out this scripture verse out of context and give it to you. here is the answer. (sighs) Manage my anxiety, yay. No. (laughs) That is what Paul is saying. Don't live like the world. That's not the way you learned Christ. And yet consistently, that is what we are doing for each other. This is why Pastor Chris and I refuse to have these hot topic conversations when the anxiety is way up here because it gets us nowhere. First, We need to get the anxiety to a level where we're ready to listen and talk with each other. And the person we look to to help us understand how to do this is Jesus. Because Jesus had the most non-anxious presence ever (laughs) as a leader. And we hear these stories in scripture of Jesus engaging in very tough questions, in very tough conversations. And what does Jesus do 99% of the time? Throws a question back at them. (laughs) Or doesn't actually answer it, but sits in silence with them, waiting for the processing to take place. Now, for sure, Jesus had some sharp words for the religious leaders. There are words in scripture where Jesus doesn't pull any punches. (laughs) He lets you know where he stands on certain things. But when it comes to caring for the community, when it comes to making sure people know that they're cared for and love, and there is a God deep down that loves every single person no matter what has happened, which is a hard pill to swallow sometimes for us, Jesus does so with gentleness, as Paul says. The Apostle Paul was someone who knew intimately what it was like to use Scripture as a weapon. Because before Paul met Jesus on the, on the road to Damascus, as is recorded for us in Acts chapter 9, he was a Pharisee. 
And he used scripture to hunt down Christians. He used scripture to approve the killing of human beings and fellow Christians. Paul knew the harm that can come from using scripture as a weapon against one another. So instead, Paul encourages followers of Jesus Christ to not use scripture as a weapon that leads to division, but to use it as a tool that leads people to a living encounter with Jesus Christ. Friends, that's what we are called to do as the church today. We are called to make sure that the main thing, the source of our energy, is focused on helping people know Jesus. Because as I mentioned earlier, Jesus is the most non-anxious person. And one of my favorite stories in all of scripture is the story when Jesus um, calms the storm with the disciples. And if you remember that story, they're floating on the Sea of Galilee. Jesus is asleep in the boat. The storm comes up all of a sudden. Jesus somehow still sleeping through the storms. The disciples are frantically bailing out, and they finally yell at Jesus, don't you care that we are perishing? And Jesus wakes up and says to the storm, be still. And the storm is still. And the disciples are overcome with awe and wonder, who is this that even the storms and wind obey? And this story to me is such a metaphor for us living as people when anxiety <laughs> rears its ugly head. Because it's as if we are the disciples in the boat. The anxiety is making us go into over-functioning mode and bail and bail and bail. And within the church, the anxiety makes us focus too much on trying to get that right answer, the right choice, the right everything, and we forget the most important person in the boat. <laughs> we forget to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. We forget to turn to Jesus to ask us, help, how do we function? How do we get through this? When the anxiety is bubbling up, <laughs> it is very easy to forget where our focus needs to be. And yet Jesus is fully aware of everything that's going on. He's God, after all. And Jesus gives the disciples, first and foremost, exactly what they need. And that is the storm to calm down. And Jesus calms the storm. And then the disciples are able to focus on Jesus. Then they're able to continue the learning, continue the engagement. I don't know what personal storms <laughs> or what communal storms you are fighting with anxiously today, but I pray and I hope that you'll remember that you've got Jesus in the boat. <laughs> that you will remember that Jesus will find a way to calm that storm to a place where you're able to get what you need, to receive the tools that you need, to have whatever tough conversation that you may face. Because Jesus reminds us that what unites us as a people is far stronger than anything that can divide us, is far stronger than any anxiety storm that can drive us insane. We put our focus on Christ. There's one more story I want to share with you, and that is to invite you to the most anxious dinner party ever. <laughs> and that was the Last Supper. When Jesus and his disciples gathered around the table, Jesus knew he was going to the cross. He knew what was about to happen. The disciples had to have been on edge because they're worried. The city is filled with people. The anxiety in the city is ramping up. The Romans, the Zealots, the Pharisees, and the Sadducees, the religious leaders, everyone is out to get Jesus. And Jesus says, we're still going to gather around the table. And they have this meal. And while this, they are having this meal, around the table we have the betrayer. We have the one who's going to deny him. We have the two who are seeking their own glory and wanting their place in the top seats. 
We have the doubter. We have these people who know Jesus, who've been following Jesus, and yet their anxiety about what's to come is through the roof. And it's to every single person around that table that Jesus still says, take and eat. Here's my body. Here's my blood given for you. One of the things that I hear a lot in the Christian community is how can someone be a Christian and believe X, Y, Z about pick your hot topic of choice. The other thing I hear a lot is this is my line in the sand as a person of faith. This is the hill that I'm going to die on. And so they cut and run from whatever community of faith they've been a part of. They leave to go find someone else that can fit into their right category, whatever it may be. And to that I say that we forget when we say, we use that language of this is the hill I'm going to die on. We forget that when we gather around this table, Jesus already died on the hill for us. (laughs) Jesus already did that. (laughs) Jesus already took all of our anxiety, all of the things that to divide us, all of the things that we are still fighting about 2,000 years later. He already took that to the cross. You don't have to die on the hill because Jesus already did it. That is the core of our faith. That is the core of what we gather around this table for. And we gather in our brokenness, in our divisions, sometimes with tears streaming down our face, seeking that God of love, that God of forgiveness, that God who says to us, come and eat, gather around the table, let's have the tough conversations. But most importantly, let's remember that you are loved, you have value, and Jesus is here, ready to change your life. So come and eat. Let's pray. Jesus, you are a wonder to us. There are so many things that we wish we knew about who you are. (laughs) There are so many things we wish you had that just said and were written in scripture so we could have clear understanding about the challenges we face in this life. And yet, instead you call us to use our minds and our hearts. You give to us your spirits of gentleness and humility. You give to us your spirit of forgiveness and grace. And so, Lord, we pray that you would empower us by that spirit today. Help us to live as people who walk the way that you walked and talk the way that you talk and are willing to close our mouths and open our ears when the need arises. And people who are willing to open our mouths while still keeping our ears open when the need arises. Lord Jesus, you are host at this table, that you call us to come and receive these gifts of grace for us. So come, Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. The Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And after he'd given thanks, he broke it and he gave it to his disciples, saying, take, eat, This is my body, which is for you. Do this as often as you eat it in remembrance of me. And in the same manner, he took the cup. And after he had blessed it, he gave it to them, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. As often as you drink of it, do so in remembrance of me. As the table has been prepared this morning, we will celebrate the sacrament of the Lord's Supper together by intinction, which means that you'll come forward, take one of our gluten-free crackers, dip it into the cup, hear the words, the body of Christ for you and the blood of Christ shed for you, 
and then return back to your seats. All of the stations are exactly the same, so it doesn't matter which one you come to. All those who sincerely desire a relationship with Jesus Christ are welcome at the Lord's table. Come, for all things are now ready. I invite the elders to come forward.
Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, we thank you for feeding us by your word and at your table here this morning. We're thankful for all of the blessings that you give to us throughout our lives. We thank you for the blessing and the gift of grace given to your, by your son, Jesus Christ, for us so that we might live. Lord, you call us to rejoice with those who rejoice. And we rejoice today with Brandon and Kira in a prayer of thanksgiving for new jobs. For Sarah, as she proclaims your message, Lord, your, in your goodness, we thank you for your provision. And Lord, for all of those who are celebrating today birthdays and anniversaries, new life, new birth, adoptions, we give you thanks and praise. And Lord, you call us to mourn with those who mourn and walk with those who are suffering. And so we lift up to you today those in our midst who are in need of your healing presence, in need of your comfort, in need of something in a special way today. We pray especially today for the family of Mark Heitmeyer who passed away following a two-year battle with cancer. We pray for Barbara Farley and her family as they mourn the death of Barbara's son, James. We pray, Lord, that you would be with the Robinson's friend, Jeff, who is in his last stage of cancer and undergoing hospice care. We pray, Lord, for Virgil, Harriet's brother, who had back surgery on Friday. Pray for his swift recovery. We pray for Brian's father in late stage Alzheimer's. We pray for Taylor, whose grandpa is in hospice care today. We pray for the people of Taiwan following an earthquake and thank you that Wenxing and Gui are safe, having been there at that time. Lord, for all of these concerns, for Wyatt, for others who are in need of your healing presence, we cry out to you. And Lord, we pray that you would strengthen and increase our faith through your mighty presence in these places. And Lord, we pray for our world, which is torn apart by conflict, much of that with anxiety as its starting point. And we pray for the church that is called to act and serve in places of pain, places of doubt, places of conflict. And Lord, we pray that as the church that we could set our own anxiety aside to be a help to someone else. Lord, help us to live our lives of faith in you and be with us to guide us through difficult times. Lord, we put our faith and our trust in you and know that our world is in your hands. And so, Lord, as you, as you have called us to serve in the world as ambassadors of your son, Jesus Christ, meant to proclaim the good news in what we say, but more importantly, in what we do. We pray for courage. And we pray that when we are weak, that is when your strength would come through. And Lord, we pray all of this in the name of Jesus Christ, who is our Lord and only Savior, and who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, 
and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let's stand together and sing. As you leave this place, I beg you to lead lives worthy of the calling to which you have been called. And may you keep your eyes fixed on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who grants you a peace that surpasses understanding. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen. Amen.